Hello, I'm Robert McKenzie, and welcome again to the fine old Harper Library in the University of Chicago. A group of guests have come together to see and to discuss the latest film by Milton Friedman in his series, Free to Choose. In this, he examines the working of the labor market and the role of labor unions, and again comes up with some controversial views in answer to the question, who protects the worker? People who earn their living in a modern heavy industry seldom engage in the kind of back-breaking toil that was the everyday lot of most workers a century ago. And yet, they earn far more. What has produced these improvements? The offhand reaction of most people is likely to be that labor unions are largely responsible for the enormous progress that workers have made in the past two centuries. But clearly, at least for the United States, that cannot be true. After all, in the 19th century, when workers did very well, there were hardly any labor unions at all. And even today, no more than one out of four or five workers is a member of a trade union. And the remainder do very well indeed, achieving the highest level of living in the world. Labor unions do, of course, benefit their members, but far from being a key to the development of the modern society, they are a throwback to an earlier pre-industrial era, to the agreements among craftsmen in the Middle Ages, or to go back even earlier, more than 2,000 years ago, to the agreement among medical men in Greece. From the tiny Greek island of Kos, the coast of Asia Minor is four miles away in the mist. 2,500 years ago, a hospital and medical school flourished on Kos. The great Hippocrates, the founder of modern medicine, worked there. Legend has it that Hippocrates taught his students in the shade of this plane tree. He welcomed anyone who wanted to learn, so long as they paid his fees. There's another legend that St. Paul stood here and preached the gospel of Christianity. What isn't legend is that Hippocrates and his followers started medicine on the road forward to becoming a science. When Hippocrates died at the age of 104, or so legend has it, this island was full of medical people, his students and disciples. Competition for custom was fierce. Some 20 years after he died, they got together and constructed a code of conduct. They named it the Hippocratic Oath, after their old teacher and master. Every new physician, before he could start practice, came to this spot back here, in front of those columns, and took the oath. The oath was full of fine ideals for protecting the patient, but it also had a couple of other things in it. Listen to this one. I will impart a knowledge of the art to my own sons and those of my teachers and to disciples bound by a stipulation and oath according to the law of medicine, but to none others. Today we'd call that a closed shop. Or listen to this one, referring to patients suffering from the agonizing disease of kidney or bladder stones. I will not cut persons laboring under the stone but will leave this to be done by men who are practitioners of this work. A nice market-sharing agreement between physicians and surgeons. Hippocrates must turn in his grave when a new class of medical men takes that oath. After all, he taught anyone, provided only they paid his tuition. He would strongly have objected 
to the kind of restrictive practices that physicians all over the world have adopted to protect their custom. In the United States, the American Medical Association has for decades been one of the strongest labor unions in the country, keeping down the number of physicians, keeping up the costs of medical care, preventing competition by people from outside the profession with those in it. All, of course, in the name of helping the patient. Without warning, any one of us may suddenly need medical care. If we do, we want the very best care we can get. But who can give us that care? Is it always a graduate of an expensive medical school who has a union card called a medical license? Or might it be someone like this, a trained paramedic working for a private enterprise organization rendering emergency care? And hopefully we'll get a very good contract out of that. Many such businesses provide primary care for emergency cases in the United States. This particular paramedic team is attached to a fire department in Southern California. They're good at their job, but it's not unusual to find local physicians objecting. They take a the Hippocratic Oath here in the United States, and they believe that they should be the one that is treating their patient. They should be the one that saves that patient's life. And if someone else does it, it just kind of interferes with everything that they've been taught. But why should medical care be a monopoly of licensed physicians? Shouldn't anyone who is capable of providing effective help be free to do so? Take your blood pressure here. Anyone see him go down? Yeah, he was just laying here when we got here. You can be sure that no one will be able to stay in this business very long unless he can demonstrate by performance that he's doing a good job. Joe Dolphin knows that very well. We've taken some statistical samples of the kind of uh, effectiveness paramedics have in California. I'll give you an example that in one district of California that we serve, which is a county, which is populated to, to the extent of 580,000 people, before the introduction of paramedics, less than 1% of the patients that suffered a cardiac arrest where their heart stopped lived through their hospital stay and were released from the hospital. With the introduction of paramedics, just in the first six months of operation, 23% of the people whose heart stops are successfully resuscitated and are released from the hospital and go back to productive work in society. We think that's pretty amazing. We think the facts speak for themselves. However, relating that to the medical community is sometimes very difficult. They have ideas of their own. Respiration is 12 and regular. Right. All right, looks good to me, Dave. Okay, Scripps, how are you reading this down there? Okay, you guys ready to go? Yeah. Uh, Scripps says code two. Code two. Disputes between union and non-union workers are not always as high-minded as between organized medicine and Joe Dolphin. One day in 1978, workers at a coal loading dock on the Ohio River in southern Indiana continued to work after the mine workers union had called a strike. That night, a crowd of armed union men invaded the site. And then they uh, fired a little building setting here after they fired Mr. T. Garden's car here and threw another fire bomb into the trailer. Others were, had run on back and were firing trucks and shooting holes through tires with handguns. I'd uh, gone back beyond the uh, loading dock here, was standing back in there, and could hear them shooting and the air escaping from truck tires. Of course, there were so many people moving around and doing so much damage and setting so many things on fire, a whole lot of things going on at one time. We should have been heavily armed and uh, shot these people, did something to stop such destruction. I wouldn't have believed that a rabble rouser could have gathered together 
that many irresponsible people to come onto a person's property and do this kind of destruction until I'd finally seen it done. These workers are on the other side of the union fence. They're building two social security offices in Baltimore. On this government project, everyone's a union worker. They rely on their union to protect them against competition from non-union labor. But some local contractors see a very different side to a closed shop. We don't feel that anybody should be denied a choice. And we feel every man should have the choice if he wants to be unionized or not. Not legislative, not saying he must belong to a union. We feel when, a, when you tell a man he must belong to a union or he must do this or that, you're taking freedoms away from this man, the freedom of choice of this businessman here to choose me, to do business with me. All business needs this right to choose to do business with each other. And by the same token, our employees have the right to choose whether they want unionization or not. On this government site, authorized personnel only really means unionized personnel only. Unions have long recognized that the surest and most effective way for them to get power without violence is to have the federal government on their side. That's why so many strong unions have made it a point to locate their headquarters close to the source of power. The heads of the trade unions at Cluster near Capitol Hill know this place very well. It is the room assigned to the Committee on Education and Labor of the House of Representatives. And it is where much of our labor legislation is discussed and shaped before presentation to Congress. Per, I, I know rooms like this myself very well, because I've often testified before congressional committees, and they all meet in rooms like this. Up there on the podium is where the members of the House or of the Senate sit. Of course, behind them, there will be clustered a bunch of aides. As you know, there are something like 30 to 40 aides for every single member of the House and the Senate. And very often in one of these committee rooms, there'll be almost nothing but aides around. When I've sat in the bear pit over here, where the witnesses sit to testify, I've sometimes thought that maybe the whole thing was a show being conducted by and for the aides, with an occasional member of the House or Senator dropping by to see what the show was all about. This is a room in which hearings were held on the most recent increase in the minimum wage, for example. Who do you suppose testified here in favor of a higher minimum wage rate? Do you suppose it was representatives of the poor people who were supposedly being helped by the bill? <laughs> Not a bit of it. The major people testifying for it were representatives of the American Federation of Labor the AFL-CIO, the major organization of trade unions in this country. There's hardly a member of one of their trade unions who works for a wage anywhere close to the minimum wage. Despite all the rhetoric about helping the poor, they were in favor of a higher minimum wage for a very different reason, because it would protect the members of their unions from competition from the lower and lesser skilled people. To see the effects of minimum wage laws in action, go to a place like this, where they sell quick and inexpensive food. You don't need much training to start work on this job. It used to be a traditional training ground for the unskilled. Not any longer, thanks to the minimum wage laws. From a worker's point of view, uh, the people that it was supposed to help, and the people in some cases it's hurting the most, uh, such as minorities, unskilled labor, and young people. Uh, a businessman, especially a small businessman, cannot afford to bring in these people at, at, the, high wa at the higher wage. Uh, they are willing, however, to take apprentices and to train them. That's very difficult to do now uh, under the minimum wage laws. The people who are discriminated against most by a high minimum wage rate are the people with low skills, which includes a disproportionate number of Negroes. 
Indeed, I have for long believed that the minimum wage rate was a most anti-Negro piece of legislation on our statute books, not by intention, but through its results. Special? Yeah. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you. <laughs> the more they get paid, the better people can live, whether they're paid in cash or in kind. The staff restaurant in the Department of Housing and Urban Development in Washington, D.C. These people are eating subsidized food. Like all civil servants, federal workers get extremely generous fringe benefits. They have also had an incredible degree of security. It's been almost impossible to fire a civil servant. In January 1975, a typist in the Environmental Protection Agency was so consistently late for work that her supervisors demanded she be fired. It took 19 months to do it. And this incredible 21-foot-long chart lists the steps that had to be gone through to satisfy all the rules and all the management and union agreements. This is really a typical horror story is what it amounts to. And it shows the, it shows the number of steps you've got to go through. The process involved the girl supervisor, his deputy director, his director, his director of personnel operations, the agency's branch chief, an employee relations specialist, a second employee relations specialist, a special office of investigations, and the director of the office of investigations. This veritable telephone directory, need I add, was paid with taxpayers' money. Instead of having a system where who could invent a better protected job than this one before it came to its end? We now have a time certain at which the decision has to be made within the agency. Half an hour's drive out of Washington, you come to Montgomery County, where many very senior civil servants live. It has the highest average family income of any county in the United States. Of the people who live here who are employed, one out of every four works for the federal government. Like all civil servants, they have job security, salaries linked to the cost of living, a fine retirement plan also linked to the cost of living, and many manage to qualify for Social Security as well, becoming double dippers. Many of their neighbors are also here because of the federal government. Congressmen, lobbyists, top executives of corporations with government contracts. As government expands, so does this neighborhood. Government protects its workers just as trade unions protect their members, but both do it at someone else's expense. It doesn't have to be that way. Dick Pashley is an electronics engineer. He designs memory systems for computers. He works for Intel Corporation, one of many companies which have sprung up south of San Francisco in a place that they call Silicon Valley. All these companies have one thing in common. They're trying to get engineers to work on their projects. You know, myself, I'm one of these engineers, and so obviously I get, uh, I get letters in the mail, phone calls, the like, where people are, are trying to get me to leave Intel and go to this particular company. One of the companies right across the street here, Intersil, is one of the new companies that's forming in this area. And they're hunting for people, just like myself, to come in. And what they do is they'll offer you, like, typically a 30% higher salary, uh, stock options, a bonus, uh, and several other things to get you to move to their company. And since it's not really a move, it's very easy to do because you're only going across the street. Uh, it's not a, a, a big traumatic thing where you're leaving, let's say, one city and moving to another city. It's very, very straightforward. In a free labor market, everybody benefits. When the market is restricted, things are very different. Those Mexicans are heading for the United States side of the border. There are real problems about permitting unrestricted immigration into a welfare state. It's one thing when people come for jobs and are on their own, as was the case for most of American history. It's another thing when a welfare system will support them come what may, at the expense of other people. Yet look what happens when you try to interfere with market forces. Well, there's several 
fairly large groups of aliens on the hillsides waiting toward to dark to set in. Other groups that are still on the Mexican side of the border. They'll be coming in shortly, I imagine. We have electronic sensors buried in along the hillsides, along the most traveled trails to alert us when there's alien crossings. And from the sensor, we work ahead of them, try to head them off. No, they're right on the fence. They're just walking east. Uh, it's 10 for. Okay. You got about, well, I'd say 100 or so here. Thank you, Fox Run. Parate, parate. Parate, parate. This is not a case of good guys against bad guys. The officers are simply trying to do their duty. The poor Mexicans are driven by hunger and attracted by the prospect of jobs. You do good work. The law enforcing people have an impossible job. They're going to run. They're going to get picked up, sent back. But sooner or later, they're going to make it time at one minute after the next, you know. In one month in 1978, 60,000 illegal immigrants were arrested on this stretch of the border. But, believe it or not, the Border Patrol estimated that nearly 200,000 found their way through to places like this in Northern California, where there was work waiting for them. Illegal Mexican immigrants are not cheap labor around here. Many earn more than the minimum wage law demands. They can do so because farmers need many extra hands during the harvest season, and there's a shortage of domestic labor available. Jill Hannum and her partner run a farm that produces plump California raisins. And there's pending legislation which would uh, make it illegal for farmers to hire uh, undocumented workers, uh, and supposedly would impose a $1,000 fine per worker on, on the farmer. I can't imagine that it would actually go through. If it did, there'd be a full-scale farmer's revolt around here. It's... Matter of fact, last year, there was quite a bit of activity in the uh, Kerman area, which is about 15 miles west of Fresno. Many of the farmers banded together and as much as warned the Border Patrol to stay off their property. And they were willing to uh, back that up with guns, I'm afraid. They were very upset about it, and because their situation was desperate, they needed the workers, and they needed the work to be, to be done now. And the Border Patrol uh, was interfering with that as they saw it. Violence by employers to assure the availability of workers is no more justifiable than violence by trade unions to assure their members' jobs. But violence is one of the things you are very likely to get when you try to prevent a deal between people who have jobs to offer and people who are looking for jobs. Fifteen years ago, the economy of Spartanburg, South Carolina, was stagnant. It depended on peaches and cotton. Wages were lower than the national average, and unemployment was higher than the average. Then, dramatically, the picture changed. The people in Spartanburg decided to make their town a center of free trade. They did this by using a new right-to-work law, eliminating many restrictions on labor. The city council cut taxes to the bone. They advertised the fact that Spartanburg was a place worth investing in. By any standards, let alone Spartanburg, the result was revolutionary. Industrialists came from Germany, Switzerland, all over the world to build factories to set up plants. The workers of Spartanburg clearly benefited from the new industries. The first to notice were the people who owned and ran the traditional industries. In terms of the business, it, it has been a, a problem for us. It means that we've got to be on our toes. We've got to be sure that we are... Uh, uh, providing a good workplace, that we are providing good jobs and what have you, and that we are 
uh, running as competitively as possible. I think that from the workers' point of view, this has certainly provided them with more opportunities to, uh, to for market for their product, their, their labor, their, their expertise. Suddenly, in a free market, workers who once could not find jobs were now at a premium. Everyone benefited, workers and employers alike, and the town thrived. One of the workers who arrived in Spartanburg was Mr. Juma. He came as a refugee from Idi Amin's Uganda. We came in this country just with $139. I had a family, my wife and two kids. And uh, as soon as and we came with only four bags of clothing which weighs about 40 pounds each bag. We were not allowed to take more than that. We have to leave all our possession, all our property in the Uganda. And myself, I just came down to Flowers Baking Company and I was hired as a, a laborer to work in the plant at two dollars forty nine cents per hour. Thank you. Five years later, he was chief accountant of the company. In a free market, his best protection, his real wealth, turned out to be his skills and his desire to use them. America has to offer me a lot of things. And this is a great country. I came in this country penniless. Today, I own a house, I own three cars. My wife has got a good job. I myself have got a good job. And the children are schooling. And everything has been working so fine. I believe this is because of the opportunity. This is whoever wants to work in this country. There's a lot of opportunity. When unions get higher wages for their members by restricting entry into an occupation, those higher wages are at the expense of other workers who find their opportunities reduced. When government pays its employees higher wages, those higher wages are at the expense of the taxpayer. But when workers get higher wages and more civilized working conditions through the free market, when they get them by firms competing with one another for the best workers, by workers competing with one another for the best jobs. Those higher wages are at nobody's expense. They can only come from higher productivity, greater capital investment, more widely diffused skills. The whole pie is bigger. There's more for the worker, but there's also more for the employer, the investor, the consumer, and even the taxpayer. That's the way a free market system distributes the fruits of economic progress among all the people. That's the essence of the age of the worker. The discussion is already underway here at the University of Chicago, so let's join it. Well, we tried a free market system without labor unions. Uh, we tried it back in the 19... 20s and into the 30s and it led the world into the biggest economic disaster it's ever seen in modern times. Now I don't think we're talking free market or labor unions, we're talking free market with or without labor unions and a free market system without labor unions is a total disaster. Let's get other reactions to this now around the group. It's the free market system, Milton Friedman's been arguing I think, not labor unions which best protect the interests and serve the interests of the worker. Walter Williams, your reaction? Well, uh, I think clearly uh, labor unions serve the best interests of uh, workers who happen to be members of uh, labor unions at the expense of workers who are excluded from being uh, members of labor unions. Ernest Green? I don't think you can have a democratic society without having trade unions. Uh, I think if you look at any democratic country, it's essential to it. Right of workers to organize, and uh, I think it's consistent. If we had to maintain a democratic uh, country, those freedoms that the right of workers to organize is, is a primary objective that we have to maintain. Bill Brady? Well, if they are so vital, uh, why are so many union members leaving the union? Uh, why, are they, uh, why are they losing so many decertification? Why are the unions losing so many de decertification uh, elections? 
why has the, uh, the number of union members declined so precipitously from 23% uh, of the labor force to, uh, what is it now, uh, less than 19, 18%? Well, it depends whose figures you're reading, but uh, workers aren't leaving the labor movement in droves, and we're, the union is not declining precipitously. Uh, my union, the United Steel Workers of America, the major unions in the country, many small ones are out organizing and growing. The mix of work, uh, the mix of work in the society is changing. We have some employers, as we saw in the film, who can't wait to rush off to the South and try to get in an anti-union environment and invest their money in prosperity mm -hmm. in the South instead of in the north and surely if you invest money anywhere you're going to have prosperity so we, we also have a mix in terms what? of civil service yeah. and service workers mm -hmm. where we have employers who have grumbled on that film I, I don't know I don't know that if you I don't know that if you invest money anywhere that you're going to have prosperity I don't think that that's a given that, that is you seem to me to be dealing in a in a in a, in a premise there that is that is incorrect but well, one we haven't got a lot of time one of the, so wait, now, one wait a minute <laughs> wait, the key question we're discussing is who protects the worker? Is it the labor union or the free market that best serves his interest? Well, uh, it seems like uh, uh, from evidence that I have uh, from a number of uh, uh, research projects that I've engaged in, I found that uh, labor unions protect their members often at the expense of uh, disadvantaged people. And, uh, and it's a very, very interesting uh, uh, question that labor unions down through the ages have discriminated against all kinds of people uh, well, in we, favor we of a particular well, class of workers. Have uh, uh, we find that uh, labor unions have gone out on strikes and have uh, murdered and uh, maimed people uh, because uh, other people sought entry. And in terms of uh, Mr. Green's remark, he says that in a free democratic society, we need labor unions. Yes, that is true. We need the right for voluntary association. That is, uh, uh, pre people have the right to form associations, but it should not be a requirement that you be a member of a labor union in order to uh, establish a contract for employment. Can't, can't, we, get some, can't we get some perspective in this, Walter? Uh, talking about unions down through the ages makes no sense at all in terms of where we're at now in this century at this time. This business of trying to relate where unions come from to the, to the medical profession and Hippocratic oaths, uh, Hippocratic oaths or Hippocritical oaths, however one looks at that, back in the Greek islands really has very little relevance. Yes, it does. The violence, hear me out a minute, I waited okay. patiently. Okay. The not violence so it's associated with, well, not so patiently, but I waited. The violence associated with the labor movement and so on has been minimal and was a reaction in this century, not over the ages, a reaction in this century to the violence done workers by corporations and powerful economic groups when there was no workers' organization to protect them and no way to deal with their greed okay. and with their okay. power. Now, now I'm turning to Milton because he's heard the flavor of the discussion. Sure, what, what, what Lynn Williams now is now saying is utter nonsense. And there's no other, no two ways about it. The conditions of the worker in this country before there was labor unions were very important, improved very greatly. You cannot tell me that millions of people, my parents, your parents for all I know, parents of many people around, came to this country from Europe in order to be exploited and in order to be uh, subject, subjected to violence. Of course, I there were incidents I agree with that violence. permanently. There I mean, were... most of the blacks came to this country, not voluntarily, the blacks, but they were shipped here. The blacks and the interesting not. thing about the, 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 about the issue not. on uh, Excuse me, Hold on though, for a second. Is that hold you on, left let, out... Let me finish, and then right. back to you, for sure. The blacks are an exception, and I agree with you completely. 22 but million exceptions, though. They are, they are a very important exception. But there are also... Millions and millions of people that Mr. Williams represents are not mostly black. They are mostly from the Slavic countries that came from well, Eastern Europe. If you Europe. look at the membership if of we, the steel workers... If, if we go back, they viol there was violence, of course. There always has been violence. Uh, it's not excusable. I'm not excusing violence on the part of anybody. But I agree with Mr. Green and with Walter Williams that people should be free to organize. Of course they should be free to organize. What I object to is the special privileges that have been given by government to labor unions which are not available to other groups at all. When labor unions have used violence in uh, industrial disputes, they are not subjected to the same sanctions as people ordinarily are. When cars are turned over in the course of a labor dispute, how often do people go to jail as a result of it? Dr. Friedman and Walter Williams go back in history and they take a look at a situation where America was empty where we didn't have anything like the sophisticated industrial economy we have today, but had a much more agricultural and rural kind of economy. And of course, when the, when the impoverished peasants of Europe, my ancestors and most of our ancestors, uh, 
except for the slaves, which is another situation. But when these people came from Europe and came to a wide open continent with the most fertile soil then available to anyone in the world, naturally there was progress. And I or any of us would be mad to deny progress. But as that developed, and as population increased, and as we moved into a much more sophisticated industrial economy, we moved then into the situation in the 1930s. Or earlier than that, at the end of the century, as some of the more skilled jobs came along, the labor movement didn't, didn't happen by accident, didn't happen because there wasn't a need there. The results of this development, even with all the wealth available in America, the results of this development was that many working people were not having anything like, by standards of, of civilization or whatever, anything like their fair share in this progress. Now, you're arguing that in a free market for labor, everyone benefits. Does that mean that you would favor abolition of all immigration restrictions? The situation of immigration restrictions really has to do with the question of a welfare state, uh, as I say in the film. I would favor completely free immigration in a society which does not have a welfare system. With a welfare system of the kind we have, you have the problem that people have immigrate in order to get welfare, not in order to get employment. You know, it's a very interesting thing. If you had asked anybody, before 1914, the U.S. had no immigration restrictions whatsoever. I'm exaggerating a little bit. There were some immigration restrictions on Orientals, but it was essentially mainly free. If you ask anybody, any American economic historian, was that a good thing for America? Everybody will say, yes, it was a wonderful thing for America that we had free immigration. If you ask anybody today, should we have free immigration today, everybody will, almost everybody will say no. What's the difference? I think there's only one difference, and that is that when we had free immigration, it was immigration for jobs in which everybody benefited. The people who were already here benefited because they got complementary workers, workers who could work with them, make their productivity better, enable them to develop and use the resources of the country better. But today... If you have a system under which uh, you have essentially a governmental guarantee of relief in case of distress, you have a very, very this real is, problem. This is true of every that, Western that, industrialized that's right, country. And that's why yep. today, under current circumstances, you cannot, unfortunately, have free immigration. Not because there's anything wrong with free immigration, but because we have other policies which make it impossible to... Uh, to adopt free immigration. Well, I like the other reactions. Is it at all feasible to open the door uh, of the labor market internationally now? Bill Brady? I would, I would say yes, providing they open the door to us. I think that the door to uh, not only the, the labor market, the door to all markets should be, should be open, that is, uh, product markets. My feelings about the uh, uh, undocumented workers of Mexican Americans are, are inscribed at the foot of the Statue of Liberty. I think that uh, people should have the right to come to this country. Now, uh, those who would say, you know, I've, I, uh, I hear a number of people saying that, well, the immigrants are contributing to our unemployment problem. And I pointed this out to some people. I said, look, you know, this is the same rhetoric that the Irish use when the blacks are coming up from the north. You know, they're using blacks as scapegoats. Uh, they're saying, get those people back where they came from so that our, cause our members can get jobs. You know, uh, unions were as well doing this. You know, they call them scabs, stri strike breakers, et cetera, et cetera. So I do not wish for uh, uh, Mexican-Americans to become the new scapegoats of our particular national problems. They are not the problem, and, and, we, and our nation benefits to the extent that these people come here and work. And to that extent, to that extent so it's, it's kind of good for them to remain illegal aliens as opposed to being uh, legal aliens where they're subject to our welfare uh, uh, program so that we don't want them to come here to work. I think, I, think, I, think, I think that this country cannot have a group of workers to remain outside the framework of our laws uh, and our protections. And as long as we have workers who are attracted to the United States because of the standard of living, and uh, I think minimum wages pay a part in that as part of that attraction. But it seems to me to have undocumented workers without providing either a means of, uh, of protection for them, and it seems to me we've got to go to a question of providing uh, uh, the amnesty for those, those generations of, uh, of workers who have come here over a period of time, now two, three, maybe four generations. We have to see that they have the same rights uh, and protection of all other workers. Mm -hmm. And as it stands now, large numbers of them live outside the framework of, uh, of the laws and statutes of the, uh, that we have on, the, uh, on our books. They Come do, and they yeah. do. And the tragedy of the situation is what Walter Williams points out, that as long as they are undocumented and illegal, they are a clear net gain 
the nation benefits and they benefit. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't be here if they didn't. Uh, the tragedy is that we've adopted all these other policies so that if we convert them into legal residents, it's no longer clear that we benefit. They may benefit, but it's no longer clear that we do. What Len Williams said before is again a travesty on what was actually going on. The real boost to the un trade union movement came after the Great Depression of the 1930s. That Great Depression was not a failure of capitalism. It was not a failure of the private market system, as we've pointed out in another one of the programs in this series. It was a failure of government. It was not the case that somehow or other there was a decline in the w conditions of the working class that produced a great surge of unionism. On the contrary, there, unions have never accounted for more than one, of, one out of four or one out of five of American workers. The American worker benefited not out of unions. He benefited in spite of unions. He benefited because there was greater opportunity because there were people who were willing to invest their money, because there was an opportunity for people to work, to save, to invest. That's still the case today. You say, we have to provide them with something or other, Ernest. Who are the we? We the people. But how do we the people? <laughs> but how do we the people and it do seems it? it? We the people provide them the protection by seeing that their safety... You're talking uh, about the immigrant population. Uh, and right? occupational health codes that protect the environment that they work in see that they have civil rights laws that protect uh, their own person, uh, see that they have uh, civil liberties laws that protect them further. We, the people of this country, provide that protection. It's so bad. If they don't have, you know, you, you're, you're kind of paying an image. You know, why are these people coming? We're well, not pulling them here by chance. It's obvious why people I mean, come here. Evidently, they're, 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 they're in the world. Conditions are much well, better. Wait, yeah. Don't, 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 think it, well, don't all talk at once. So what are you talking about protecting them? Why did you leave Little Rock, Arkansas huh? to go to I mean, Philadelphia? It seems, it seems to me that it's obvious why. Would you extend the courtesy to finish? Look, look. First thing, let, look, let me say the following thing, because there's some basic things that well, you now need to know. Well, I'm going to say the thing so, I was interrupting. I'm going to say no, five more no, things. I mean, no, there isn't all that, afternoon. That, you know, labor unions and minimum wages for that case cannot improve the condition of the working people of a country. We do it every because, day. Because if... We can improve you know, the are you condition of working people in countries you, all around well, you, the world. You know what this man... Every you, day. You know what you're telling the audience? You're saying that you can solve the problems in I Bangladesh. You can that. make them a rich country if you tell them that. to unionize like we are that. and demand higher I, wages. No, I didn't say anything remotely well, like that. No, then, it's, it's productivity that keeps them coming up. I come back to my initial question. Why are so many leaving the union? There aren't very many Oh, there are, too. Come on I've given you the statistics. You think I'm... Rhymed off some percentages. I live well, in the you, labor you, movement. You, do you have other percentages? In or well, on? It's, it's true. <laughs> in, with, and, and, of, and of course they pay me. Of course, right. I don't have any objection to that at Neither all. Neither do I. At least we got you a few minutes ago. We got you to get the labor movement up into this century. And I agree with the observation you made. I agree with the observation you made that the industrial union movement, that there was a union movement, came out of the out of the dirty 30s and out of the depression and grew and that that was essentially an industrial union movement. But I wonder if, I, I wonder when I, when I hear your commentary on the film and so on about unions and restricting practices and restricting access to industry and all of this, I really, I don't mean it disrespectfully, but I really don't want... Don't mind I being disrespectful. That's all right, I'm used I to really it. I <laughs> really wonder if you, if you do understand how the industrial union movement, which is, is the more recent part of the movement, how it really operates. We're not telling anybody who they have to hire. <laughs> We're not doing anything. Else. Let's raise the question, which certainly is dealt with in the film. Yeah. Have minimum wages, which is a form of government intervention, served the interests of the poor and indeed of the working class generally? Now, I know you've spent a good deal of time looking at this. I'd like yes. you to come in on it, too. Okay, well, uh, if, at least from from the standpoint of teenagers, particularly minority teenagers, uh, the minimum wage law has acted to destroy a number of employment opportunities. For example, back in 1948, the uh, black youth between uh, 16 and 18 uh, uh, had an unemployment rate of 9.4 percent, and white youth was 10.4 percent, a 10.2 percent. The labor force participation rates of blacks was considerably higher than that of uh, whites and with each increase in the minimum wage law we had the dramatic reversal that we have now and so the minimum wage law has the effects of saying that if you cannot produce two dollars and ninety cents worth of goods an hour you don't deserve a job but and I don't think you can't look just at but, minimum wage you well, gotta look at the relocation well, yeah, yeah, of firms You've got to you've uh, got to look at the movement of people. You I mean you can't well, well, you can't you, do that. Well, you look at re relocation of firms. A lot of people try to say a lot, a lot of jobs move out to the suburbs. Well, you find black white uh, unemployment ratios the same in the suburbs as you find in the cities. 
So it's I mean, it's it's yes, in a way. You're taking one element. And, and, you're taking one and, element and of a long historic development. And when you even start comparing it, even, 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 even if Lynn you is next, and if you Lynn and then constant, Ernest Green. Come on now. I understand the more education. Lynn and then Ernest Green. You get a differential between black and white. I'll bang the gavel. Come on, Lynn. Well, you're, ta you're taking uh, one element uh, years ago in a situation that's entirely different than we're in today yeah, we and drawing some conclusions. Age. That's what's the difference. No, no, there are many <laughs> other things that are different. The enormous movement of black people in this country between yeah. 1948 and now, you can't just wipe that out. And you well, have white people that too. You certainly can't yep. say that's the minimum wage. But, you know, and that now, has an now, enormous I'll, amount. I this case made. Well, now, is, just, has the minimum that, wage served the interests of the, of the working I, I don't people think of this country? Any question, I don't think there's any question that the working people of this country would be much worse off than they are today. The youth of this country would be much worse off than they are today if we didn't have minimum okay, wage. Okay, now, now Bill Brady, you well, come on. Well, no, it's a uh, minimum wage. It's, good idea yeah, or not? Yeah, no, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a bad idea. Uh, it, is, it is patently one, one of the one of the worst things that can that we can do to our youth. We prevent them well, from. How many we, kids do you have? We, we what's that? How many kids do you have? I have two. It's not important how many well, people it is. Minimum yeah. wage doesn't affect his industry. His wages are far minimum above the minimum wage. Minimum wage doesn't affect a single one no. of his members. It but affects people about whom we're going to Hold it, hold it, hold it. Hold it. Hold it. We Nobody have has not the floor. gone to support <laughs> minimum wage legislation <laughs> in this country. Gentlemen, hold it a moment. Hold it a moment. Hold it a moment now. Of course we have not. We are a people's organization. The chairman has said the floor is Milton's. I was saying that there's not a single one, I suspect, of the uh, of the members of your union who is affected by the minimum wage fact, rate, they're much nope. higher. You say that you are a public service organization. I say we're a people's organization. You're, a, you're an organization of your workers, and if you aren't representing the interests of your workers, they ought to fire you. And we're out. If you tell us that you are going against the interests of your workers, then you are simultaneously saying but, to your workers, oh, I'm not on. doing this what you're This, is, this, is, this is, is pure sophistry. I'm it's not, not sophistry I, in the I am not talking, <laughs> I'm I am not talking to... about representing the interests of our workers. Our union represents a lot of people. Right. And some it of does. the people are the ones that you're probably aware of, the people who work in big steel mills Absolutely. and all the rest of it. Absolutely. But we also go out and organize workers all the time and win certification votes, despite Bill Brady's comment about that. And many of the workers we organize are workers who are affected by minimum wage. Uh, well, well, and the result of our organizing them is we're able to bring well, them well, a well, minimum wage. And I, I, yes. Yeah, but the, I mean, the, the, the point is, is that I think that both these gentlemen, uh, uh, we all should recognize, is that unions in the United States support the minimum wage. They are the major supporters, and they spend millions and millions of dollars in lobbying for the minimum wage law. Well, now they do, spend, they do it. The money, they do it out of the they do it out of the name of concern and being in the interest of people. Now. In South Africa, the unions are far more honest. That is, those white racist unions over there, they say we support minimum wages and equal pay for equal work so, so as to protect white jobs. That is, to protect jo are white you, are jobs from low price competition. But are you not now, implying no, that we're white racist unions? No, I'm not saying that. No, saying I'm that? saying that it doesn't make any difference about the intent. Walter, the, the, the effects are, the urban the league effects are independent minimum of intent. Wage, the, the, well, well, they have heard the men hooks of the NAACP they have support minimum wage. The floor blocks the reason support minimum wage. Why? They're good. They represent. They represent middle class blacks. No, no. They don't no. represent the, the poor blacks on the street. The membership of the NWACP you know, and, and are probably. Okay. And they're owned by the, the okay. owned by the AFL CIO. They aren't owned by the AFL CIO. Order. Order. What kind of a conservative says order? I'm going to turn I'm going to turn to Milton now. Uh, are you saying then that you would advocate the repeal of minimum wage legislation? Of course. You would. Yeah. Of course I would. Well, I, but, well, well, I, well, I, Bill Brady, Bill Brady. I should like to ask Ernest and Lynn why they want to restrict a, a minimum price to labor. Uh, why don't you let me have a minimum price on the products that we manufacture? Well, we aren't here, as I understand it, to discuss your problems at the moment in terms of well, the owners. Well, is, there, is, the there, is, there, is there a difference? Why, well, a minimum, you're, a minimum you're, on the, a product you're the people, I assume, are so anxious to have the free market system and to compete with each other and all the rest of it. We're talking about the needs of the workers. We're talking about the needs of the people who come into a society which isn't providing enough employment for them, which clearly doesn't seem to be able to provide enough employment for them, and what are we going to do? And I think this notion that somehow if we just let every guy who's running a Hamburg stand or whatever, if we just let all these people exploit the young people of this nation in any way they chose, pay them any little rate they could get away with, that everybody would then to go to work. 
It would have, everybody then have a job? Is uh, absolute Mr. nonsense. I want to bring Milton to one of the final stages of his film, which is on Spartanburg, South Carolina. Sure. And I want to know what, you're, what conclusion you're drawing from that. Would you, in effect, like to see the whole of the United States become, as it were, Spartanburg writ large? Absolutely. Yeah. What would that mean? And then we'll get their reaction to it. It would mean a widening of the opportunity for everybody. It would mean an opportunity for employers all over to compete with one another for workers. It would mean an opportunity for workers to find jobs which can make the greatest use of their own skills and their own capacities. It would mean that consumers would be able to get better products at lower prices. You know, consumers enter into this situation, too. You might think that somehow or other, you know, one of the things that's always a mystery to me, if a $2.90 minimum wage benefits people, why wouldn't a $6 minimum wage be better? Wouldn't a $10 minimum wage be better? Why don't these people come out for a $200 a year minimum wage? If all you had to do is to, to make a country $200 proud... $200 a year is pretty small. $200 or, or, a day, an hour. Uh, or extend it to babysitters. <laughs> yeah, if, if all you need to improve the lot of conditions of people is to legislate a higher work No, no, you're back on minimum wages. I want to know right. how Spartanburg well, say, would... Spartanburg large. improves matters because it introduces a wider range of competition. And the real thing that protects a worker is the existence of alternative employers seeking his services, just as what protects a consumer is alternative sellers. Milton, you, you omit one thing that it would do, and it would uh, result in a very substantial increase in capital investment. Absolutely, it would. And, and capital is, is, is the worker's second best friend. Sure. This, the this reason is why everybody say, can surely, benefit. This is only to say that a busy economy one in which there's investment and development and so on is an economy that's a good economy for working people and for everyone else. I think we say that in the AFL-CIO at least once a month, all the time. There's nothing, in which, there's nothing in which we're more interested than having a busy, functioning economy. The question is how to bring that about. I do suggest, and I think, would, would, uh, I think can be defended uh, as long as we want to discuss it, that the prosperity we have in America today, that the labor movements have made an enormous, labor movement has made an enormous contribution to that, and in the absence of the labor movement, and in the absence of minimum wage, this would not be as prosperous a country as it is. Now, hold it that there. Is not to hold say it there, Lynn. I want to get a reaction to that. He stated the case uh, for what the unions achieved. Could we go around, first of all, do you accept any part of that? You know, it's preposterous, you know, as I suggested before. I mean, if we, if we, if, you know, if minimum wages can make people richer... The unions are talking about Well, now. if unions can make people yeah. richer, well, all you have to do is tell people in Bangladesh, why don't you unionize and demand a higher wage? You can be rich like the United States. We're telling them it's everywhere productivity. in the world. We told them in Japan. No, it, no, it worked. You know, workers have higher wages in our country because they're more productive. That's how you get higher wages. And, and this is just plain, I mean, it's nonsense. And why are they more productive? Huh? Because they have capital. Enormous and, uh, capital investment. Oh, no, right. Right. Yeah, and the highest right. wages are paid in the highest in capital intensive industry. And because there are consumers to buy the stuff who have wages which enable them to go into the marketplace and buy something. Without the, without all, the capital all investment, all they wouldn't have the wages. Money, there, there would be, be no way of paying them without the capital investment. That's a Ernest Green, what's the reply? I stand by my initial statement that it is a, a prerequisite of a democratic society to have trade unions, organizations allowing workers to band together in their mutual interests. And if, if, that, if that group, I'm saying that trade unions uh, like A. Philip Randolph, sleeping car porters, the, the Pullman car company would have never on its own given those workers who worked very hard, yep. were very productive yep. people, well-educated, any increase in their wages had it not been for the intervention of Randolph. The crucial issue is whether governmental measures which have the effect of favoring union organization of giving them privileges and immunities that are not accorded to other organizations in the society benefit the society as a whole or harm the society as a whole the proposition i tried to make in this film was that the source of the prosperity of this country was freedom of enterprise freedom of employers to hire of workers to work for whom they wanted to that insofar as unions had played a role, they had protected some workers at the expense of others and had retarded the prosperity of this country. I think that Lynn Williams' statements to the contrary cannot be supported by any empirical or other evidence that he has, understandably, I'm not blaming him for this, uh, he would be faithless to his job if he did not 
believe sincerely in what he's saying. I'm not questioning his sincerity, but sincerity is a much overrated virtue in our society. The plain fact is that there is no evidence whatsoever that either unions or minimum wages have made positive contributions to the prosperity of this country. Some unions have. Of course, some unions have done great harm. It's not an, uh, an open and shut picture in which you can make a, a sweeping statement. But on the whole, the growth Why of this country... The, I do. <laughs> the sweeping statement I make is that the prosperity of this country derives primarily from freedom of enterprise and freedom to hire, to employ, to work, and not from restrictive measures imposed by trade unions. Everybody briefly now. We're in and I would say that the intervention of a strong federal government who those employers hire, the kinds of protection, uh, the wage standards, uh, health conditions are the, are the requirement of this government to protect its people because the history of it has shown that that hasn't occurred. And in your case uh, in Spartansburg, South Carolina, again, I argue that the only reason that they can come back now and attract firms from Switzerland and Germany is because, one, that we had a strong government that provided protection for all of its citizens, which didn't occur 15 years Bill Brady. ago. Economic freedom, in my opinion, should not be a bridge. I think that these two gentlemen are advocating that it be a bridge. They're advocating a retention of the minimum wage. They're advocating, I think, that Lynn Williams is advocating a retention of the, of the Davis-Bacon uh, Act. Uh, they, uh, they do not, it seems to me, believe that freedoms are interdependent and indivisible. There are freedoms, there's economic freedom, there's press freedom, there's freedom of, of, of assembly, there's religious freedom. And you, you are advocating to me a, a great abridgment of economic freedom. And when you do that, you, you injure the other freedoms that we have. And if you do it enough, as we are doing in this country today, if you do it enough, we are in danger of losing all of our other freedoms. Now we leave this very spirited discussion, and I hope you'll join us again in the next episode of Free to Choose. Next week, Milton Friedman focuses on one of the most disturbing problems in the world today, the problem of inflation. There is a way to deal with it. If you want to find out how to cure inflation, don't miss Free to Choose next week. The oath was full of fine ideals for protecting the patient, but it also had a couple of other things in it. Listen to this one. I will impart a knowledge of the art to my own sons and those of my teachers and to disciples bound by a stipulation and oath according to the law of medicine, but to none others. Today we would call that a closed shop. Or listen to this one referring to patients suffering from the agonizing disease of kidney or bladder stones. I will not cut persons laboring under the stone, but will leave this to be done by men who are practitioners of this work. A nice market sharing agreement between physicians and surgeons. Hippocrates must turn in his grave when a new class of medical men takes that oath. After all, he taught anyone provided only they paid his tuition. He would strongly have objected to the kind of restrictive practices that physicians all over the world have adopted to protect their custom. In the United States, the American Medical Association has for decades been one of the strongest labor unions in the country, keeping down the number of physicians, keeping up the costs of medical care, 
preventing competition by people from outside the profession with those in it. All, of course, in the name of helping the patient. Can you sit up? I don't know. Can you feel it? I've got her support right here. Without warning, any one of us may suddenly need medical care. If we do... Hello, I'm Robert McKenzie, and welcome again to the fine old Harper Library in the University of Chicago. A group of guests have come together to see and to discuss the latest film by Milton Friedman in his series, Free to Choose. In this, he examines the working of the labor market and the role of labor unions, and again comes up with some controversial views in answer to the question, who protects the worker? People who earn their living in a modern heavy industry seldom engage in the kind of back-breaking toil that was the everyday lot of most workers a century ago. And yet, they earn far more. What has produced these improvements? The offhand reaction of most people is likely to be that labor unions are largely responsible for the enormous progress that workers have made in the past two centuries. But clearly, at least for the United States, that cannot be true. After all, in the 19th century, when workers did very well, there were hardly any labor unions at all. And even today, no more than one out of four or five workers is a member of a trade union. And the remainder do very well indeed, achieving the highest level of living in the work. Before the introduction of paramedics, less than 1% of the patients that suffered a cardiac arrest where their heart stopped lived through their hospital stay and were released from the hospital. With the introduction of paramedics, just in the first six months of operation, 23% of the people whose heart stops are successfully resuscitated and are released from the hospital and go back to productive work in society. We think that's pretty amazing. We think the facts speak for themselves. However, relating that to the medical community is sometimes very difficult. They have ideas of their own. Respirations 12 and regular. Right. All right, looks good to me, Dave. Okay, scripts, how are you reading this down there? Okay, you guys ready to go? Yeah. All right, Script says code 2. Code 2. Disputes between union and non union workers are not always as high minded as between organized medicine and Joe Dolphin. One day in 1978, workers at a coal loading dock on the Ohio River in southern Indiana continued to work after the mine workers union had called a strike. That night, a crowd of armed union men invaded the site. And then they uh, fired a little building setting here after they fired Mr. T. Garden's car here and threw another fire bomb into the trailer. Others were, had run on back and were firing trucks and shooting holes through tires with handguns. I'd uh, gone back beyond the uh, loading dock here, and was standing back in there, and could hear them shooting in the air, escaping from truck tires. Of course, there were so many people moving around and doing so much damage and setting so many things on fire, a whole lot of things going on at one time. We want the very best care we can get, but who can give us that care? Is it always a graduate of an expensive medical school who has a union card called a medical license? Or might it be someone like this, a trained paramedic working for a private enterprise organization rendering emergency care? And hopefully we'll get a very good contract out of that. 
Many such businesses provide primary care for emergency cases in the United States. This particular paramedic team is attached to a fire department in Southern California. They're good at their job, but it's not unusual to find local physicians objecting. They take a the Hippocratic Oath here in the United States, and they believe that they should be the one that is treating their patient. They should be the one that saves that patient's life. And if someone else does it, it just kind of interferes with everything that they've been taught. But why should medical care be a monopoly of licensed physicians? Shouldn't anyone who is capable of providing effective help be free to do so? Take a blood pressure here. They want to see him go down. Yeah, he was just laying here when we got here. You can be sure that no one will be able to stay in this business very long, unless he can demonstrate by performance that he's doing a good job. Joe Dolphin knows that very well. We've taken some statistical samples of the kind of uh, effectiveness paramedics have in California. I'll give you an example of that in one district of California that we serve, which is a county, which is populated uh, to the extent of 580,000 people. Labor unions do, of course, benefit their members, but far from being a key to the development of the modern society, they are a throwback to an earlier pre-industrial era to the agreements among craftsmen in the Middle Ages, or to go back even earlier, more than 2,000 years ago, to the agreement among medical men in Greece. From the tiny Greek island of Kos, the coast of Asia Minor is four miles away in the mist. 2,500 years ago, a hospital and medical school flourished on Kos. The great Hippocrates, the founder of modern medicine, worked there. Legend has it that Hippocrates taught his students in the shade of this plane tree. He welcomed anyone who wanted to learn, so long as they paid his fees. There's another legend that St. Paul stood here and preached the gospel of Christianity. What isn't legend is that Hippocrates and his followers started medicine on the road forward to becoming a science. When Hippocrates died at the age of 104, or so legend has it, this island was full of medical people, his students and disciples. Competition for custom was fierce. Some 20 years after he died, they got together and constructed a code of conduct. They named it the Hippocratic Oath after their old teacher and master. Every new physician, before he could start practice, came to this spot back here in front of those columns and took the 